Welcome to Snooze with Sam. This is just a little message to say thank you so very much for 4,000 subscribers. And realistically we're about 4,100 now. Uh, it means a whole great deal that you all support me so much, by the way and find my stories to be a part of your every day. I think that's just amazing. It's at the point now where not five minutes goes by in the day where somebody around the world isn't listening to a story. Now isn't that just the most bizarre fact for just one guy from a little Scottish island? It's lovely though. I, I can't really describe how special that is. But a special thank you as well to my patrons who continually support and encourage me in my goals for this channel. One day in the near future, I hope that Snooze with Sam can become one of the most prosperous sleep channels on YouTube, while still remaining as humble and grounded as, as as always and as possible. I am a real person with a real life just like you and it's no secret that these stories are made in the spare minutes of a very busy life. My patrons know my true ambitions for this channel and what its growth really means for both myself and others as well. Again, thank you. Please keep doing what you're doing. Please keep subscribing, supporting, liking and commenting if you could. I get sick of hearing it myself from other creators, but I, I understand why they have to say it. All of these actions do more than you realise. I know I am one person in thousands using this platform, but uh, it's tough out there. Like I said, I'm a real person. <laughs> uh, I know I'm just a faceless voice on the internet, uh, but I hope that doesn't detract from the fact that I am yeah, a real character, a real personality. Just honestly trying to get through life as best they can and support as many other people along the way so all of that matters thank you so as always lie back take a deep breath and enjoy this story. This story is called Night Under the Stars. It shouldn't take all too long to gather enough firewood to last the night. With each step, you scan the forest floor, hunting for the choicest pieces of twig felled branch 
and other things which will burn quite nicely. Pretty much anything will do. It is a dry night and it's been dry for a few days. Though the forests of Argyle and Butte do hold on to their moisture as long as possible. Stooping down, you scoop and palm some pine needles. A hint of wet, but nothing prohibitive. Each piece of fire fuel is stowed in a satchel which hangs from your shoulder. Pine cones make great wee fire lighters, so long as they are not too new. Covered in rough edges, they catch a flame like nobody's business, and they hold their heat once alight. Other than smaller pieces of kindling and dry leaves, of course, you need the big boy branch. Anyone who's camped knows about the big boy branch. That tree trunk or enormous log which is far too big to burn, really. But you are adventurous and stubborn enough to drag it back to your fire regardless. An end of it is hovered over the flames in a feeble attempt to create a big blaze. But it rarely concludes in such. Instead, in the morning, you're simply left with a mildly charred lump of wood, which is practically shrugged off all of your efforts. Either way, it's fun, and you clasp under your arm a suitably unsuitable length of pine 
about seven feet long. It may be dry on this evening, but it certainly is cold. Hovering around freezing. The sun is long gone, well below the horizon. It was a blue sky day, crisp and fresh, perfect for adventuring. The kind weather has brought you through these forests with the temptation of clear night skies. Unpolluted by light, with the whole universe just for yourself. You feel as though enough wood has been gathered to get a fire going. So back towards camp you go. Although alone on your travels, you certainly aren't in many other ways. Owls hoot away happily, content with the dark evenings drawing in. Their nocturnal habits signalling their rise and shine. Across the lochs, somewhere far away, the ever-present coughing and barking of red deer coasts for miles and miles around. You soon realise when you venture into the wild fairly often. There really is no escaping them. The majority believe red deer to be a rare sound and rarer sight. Yet out with the towns and cities, they feel as common as crows or squirrels. That is not to say they aren't special. Of course they are. Usually shy, beautiful 
and majestic creatures. But you feel as though they make up just as integral a part of the wilderness as the waters and forests themselves. Occasionally, the shriek and wail of foxes stabs through the darkness. Out here, far from civilization, they are as wild an animal as any. If you are very lucky, you never know. You may also see the likes of grouse, pine marten, badger, or even a stoat. Perhaps even a red squirrel. But probably not at night. Approaching your camp, you can't help but admire the views. Perched right on the water's edge, the tall Scots pines thin out a little. opening up the sky above. The waters of the loch sit below the steep bank from which the woodland floor falls. Against the shore, little freshwater waves lap against pebbles and tree roots, merely tinkling on this quiet and still evening. Above, the tall trees reach high into the sky and carry in their canopies the interlaced nests of buzzards, herons and rooks. Across the loch, only the faint moonlight picks out any surface ripples. The rest of it remaining largely undisturbed and still. Already, in the early evening, the 
the sky gives way to the brightest stars. Though not at all pitch black, the sky sits in between a purpley blue and a deep endless navy abyss. A proper twilight indeed. Oh, and of course, your little two-man tent is set up and ready for your sleepy self when the time comes. Again, I'm sure those who have camped before will fully agree that a one-man tent realistically translates into a two-thirds man tent. And those of you who prefer not to sleep as if you're in a coffin may appreciate the slight extra birth of a two-man tent. which is about right for one person. Your tent is a nice, subtle, forest green shade, so as to blend into the surroundings. Purple with yellow spots would be cool and all. But your respect for nature overrules this desire for outlandish design. Another jolt of cold air reminds you about your collected wood slung from your shoulder. Time to get the toasty wee thing going. As usual, you arrange the driest and finest pieces of kindling in a base first. Taking to one knee, you balance and knit each piece delicately against the other, creating a perfect wee amalgamation of fuel and airspace. On top of that, you prop larger twigs and small pine branches still with needles on. These will take to light next.
That will do for now. As you'll make sure the fire's going fast. Before slinging some great logs on it. Risking smothering the flame. To provide some shelter and contain the heat. You surround the fire with some large, smooth rocks to create a fire pit of sorts. Happy that the fire is set to begin firing, you remove your trusty little box of matches from your nearby backpack. Some may argue that a flint and steel is a truer method of wild campfire starting. And I, they'd maybe be right. But you can't be bothered with that. And sometimes, why make it more difficult for yourself? when you are freezing your knackers off. With a firm strike, the match jumps ablaze. And so you guide the flaming sticklet into the heart of the timber teepee. As if erected by the bushcraft gods, the little pile of kindling lights with no issues. You wait for the reliable crackle of the larger bits of wood to catch before boxing in the flames with some larger logs. Sound as a pound. She's looking awful bonny. Next up, a wee tin kettle is produced from the rucksack. And you promptly fill it with water from your bottle. What is a cold night with the night sky without a hot bevy? Precisely. Placing it by the now healthy fire on a nearby flat stone. You wait patiently for it to warm up.
the light lulling of the nearby loch brings you consciously connected to your surroundings. More often than not, moving water blends into the background and you stop noticing it. Sometimes, for no reason in particular, it can take your attention back. You enjoy it for a moment. It is most peaceful. It feels very fitting on this clear evening. How about some local scran? Rummaging about in your backpack of many things. Your hands find their intended targets. Some of your homegrown tatties. Rid of most of their soil. Palming them and feeling a small amount of pride for having conjured these things from your garden. A wee splash of water and a rag removes the remainder of the soil. Wrapping them in a piece of tin foil with a tiny knob of butter and some salt. You tuck them in tightly and place them next to the base of the fire at the edge of the flames. In a wee while, they will be simply stunning. Settling back on your wee camping chair. You pull a big fleecy blanket around your feet, legs and waist. And pop your hat and gloves on to keep your body heat in. With a little sigh of satisfaction, you allow your head to tilt back and soak it all in. With wide eyes and limitless curiosity, Taking up every part of your vision, 
The night sky sprawls across as far as your peripheral can reach in every direction. By now, a deep inky shawl speckled with tiny glinting lights shimmers through the upper atmospheres. In time, you spot famous constellations. Leo, Scorpio, Ursa Major, and the so distinctive trio of Orion and his belt. You've always been fascinated by outer space. It's impossible not to be. Even in school, you are immediately encapsulated by anything which shod some starlight on our universe. Relaxing your eyes and letting them adjust further to the gloom. Spread right across the middle of the sky was the central portion of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Distinctly paler, containing millions and millions of other stars. We look in from our position on an outer arm of our spiral. You find yourself reflecting on what you have learned about our galaxy. And the words of your professors ring in your memory. The Milky Way galaxy is our celestial hometown. Think of it as a vast metropolis with as many as 200 billion stars. But it is just one of a possible 150 billion galaxies in the universe. It is where our solar family, Earth, the Sun, and our eight sister planets are found. We are relative newcomers, as our solar system was formed more than four and a half 
billion years ago. There are stars much older than our sun. The majority of them near the bulge at the centre of the Milky Way. At the heart of this bulge is a black hole with the mass of three million suns. A region of such powerful gravitational pull that even light cannot escape from it. This central bulge of the galaxy is set within a thin disk of stars around 100,000 light years wide. And by the way, a light year is 5.9 trillion miles, if you can even comprehend that. We and our sun are located far from the centre of the metropolis. We are in a kind of suburb out on a long arm of the spiral-shaped Milky Way galaxy. The view is quite nice when you see pictures. From our place in space, we can look both in towards the galaxy's centre and also out as far into space and time as modern telemetry can take us. Even still, the vast number of stars we see with the naked eye are all immediate neighbours, fellow residents of our galaxy. Galaxies come in many different sizes and several shapes. And all are made, not only of stars, but also of gas and dust and the invisible material astronomers call dark matter. We cannot see dark matter But as much as 90% of a galaxy's mass consists of it. The Milky Way is not alone in our sector of the universe. It belongs to a small cluster of galaxies called the Local Group. So we're not entirely alone. Almost like a little clique. 
And in this little group, there are some three dozen known other members. It's completely fascinating. Beyond a few stray branches, reaching out from the treetops, a brief flash of light catches your eye. A shooting star. How wonderful. Again, it's more of a question of when rather than if you see some. When gazing endlessly skyward, this one was short but bright and came from the north, headed west. Ever since seeing your first shooting stars, or meteorites, when you were young, these two have fascinated you ever since. It feels incomprehensible that our little planet is being constantly bombarded by these speeding pieces of space debris. That's exactly what's happening. Sometimes these wee meteors can be journeying on their own. But other times they can be part of what's called a meteor shower. Meteor showers occur when dust or particles from asteroids or comets enter the Earth's atmosphere at very high speed. When they hit the atmosphere, these meteors rub against air particles and create friction, heating the meteors up. It's this heat which vaporizes most which enter the atmosphere, creating what we call and see as those shooting stars. Whilst there are stray bits of stuff hitting Earth from all directions, there are also regularly timed meteor showers when astronomers can make better predictions about how many meteors will hit the Earth and from what direction.
The key difference is that meteor showers occur when the Earth ploughs into the trail of particles left behind by a comet or asteroid. Depending on where the trail of particles falls in a particular year, meteor showers can be more or less intense. Most meteors become visible at around 60 miles up. That's around 96 and a half kilometers, roughly. Some large meteors splatter, causing a brighter flash called a fireball, which can often be seen during the day and heard up to 30 miles away. On average, meteors can speed through the atmosphere at around 30,000 miles an hour, which is just over 48,000 kilometers an hour. She's moving by that stage, eh? And they can also reach temperatures of about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 1,600 degrees Celsius, give or take. The majority of these meteors are very small, some as tiny as a grain of sand, so they disintegrate in the air. Larger ones that can and do reach the Earth's surface are called meteorites and are very rare. Whether or not one of these objects breaks apart depends on its composition, speed and angle of entry. A faster meteor at an oblique angle, basically slanting rather than straight on, suffers greater stress. Meteors made up of iron withstand the stress better than those just of stone. But even an iron meteor will usually break up as the atmosphere becomes denser around five to seven miles up. Whilst your thoughts drift and time passes 
without note. Again you relax your gaze, allowing it to indirectly pick up the faintest of movements. Eventually, just to the left of your focal point, another shooting star burns across the night sky at such a leisurely pace you swear it was walking. You have so much time to focus on it. You follow it from the treetops, right over the open water of the loch, savouring every moment. No matter how many times you witness these meteorological spectacles, they never get any less special. It's all very well Knowing, understanding, and appreciating the science behind these marvels. Yet sometimes it's nice just to witness the magic in its truest form, without thinking too much about it. The sizzle and spit of a boiling kettle combined with the tantalizing aroma of a perfectly roasted tatty stirs you from your awe. Pouring yourself a wee herbal tea and carefully unwrapping your wee potato you sit up a little and tuck in savouring the salty buttery and caramelised flavour I'm hungry now. And so, tucked up, all warm in your chair, beneath the lush pine trees, on the banks of the loch. You gaze onwards towards the galaxy above. Loving every moment of your night under the stars. Warm tea and tatty in hand. 